are these places of power because there is an ancient site there, or where these ancient sites built on places of power? We're getting into bizarre areas of relationships that you really have to invest the time to start peeling back the onion. Do you remember the goat? I don't remember the goat. What you had there was the detonation of a 15 megaton cosmic missile. Bring me a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All this heavy talk is making me hungry. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll take it from here. Uh, so how does one end up in Andorra? Yeah, because I've I've lived in a lot of different places. And um, I actually spent a lot of time in Spain. Um, so I was living in Russia, then I was living in China. Um, and in the last couple of years, Russia was getting a little bit dodgy for foreigners. Um, so I decided I'd come back, and I'd spent a lot of time in Asia and China. So I felt like I'd come back to Europe. And Andorra is a very easy place to come and work. It's easy to get a visa. You don't have to worry about working papers. It's pretty simple. It's a pretty simple process. So I came here and started just started a business, and um, taxes are really low, and a lot of there's a lot of places that are closed, but yeah, that's basically yeah. what I got here. You know? it's not actually part of the European Union, is it? No, actually, it's not. Though yeah. they're beginning the process of trying to integrate, especially they had you know they had a banking crisis here after the Panama Papers. Oh yeah, and um, it was it almost it. Almost toppled Andorra. Andorra, apparently, from somebody I know who worked pretty high, pretty high level banker here, it almost collapsed. They were almost ready to tell the Spanish or the French, okay, you know, how do we make a deal about dissolving Andorra and becoming part of um, either Spain or France? They got that bad. Hmm. And it's all because the Americans had found a lot of Russian money in Andorra through the Panama Papers. So the CIA all of a sudden decided to say that Andorra, there were suspicions about banking in Andorra. They didn't really care about that. They cared about nailing the Russian money here. There's a lot of Russian money in Andorra. Wow. So there are tens of millions, maybe more, of dollars in what they call the B-Bank that until it's verified the origins of the money, that money stays in this account. So a lot of people lost a lot of money. Yeesh. Yeah. Wow. Little things you didn't know about Andorra. Little conspiratorial angle. <laughs> you didn't expect that, but that's cool. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's it, you know, I mean, I think that's the only explanation why the CIA, or I think it was the State Department, would come out and say something, you know. Makes sense. About Andorra. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, we can leave that out if you want. I mean, I'm cool with all that. Oh, that, that yeah, that's fine. You that part you can leave in. That's okay. That's we just, can leave I mean, it. Okay. Yeah, that's, all right, that's cool. fine. Yeah, yeah. How many people? How many, was it? You said sixty thousand people. I believe the population is sixty. But what's really interesting is the that's actual actually bigger than I thought. Really, citizens of Andorra might be like fifteen or twenty thousand. Oh, okay. Okay. Most of the people who work here are just um, foreign workers. Yeah, it's like this weird holdover kind of from like when Spain was all in different pieces is what it kind of seems like to me. Yeah, kind of, kind of. It's 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 just bizarre. And I think it also, it, it gained a lot of prominence. Well, not a prominence, but in during the Franco years in Spain, a lot of Spanish people escaping Franco would come here. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And the French gave them a certain amount of protection. So they really they couldn't come in after them. And you're from the States originally? Yeah. I was born in New York, but I was raised in Florida. Okay. So right, cool. I went to UF. You guys you guys didn't go to Tennessee, did you? No. 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 Well I went to oh. I actually did go to a University of Tennessee school. Not oh, not okay. uh UT Knoxville, but are you guys mortal no. enemies now? <laughs> no, my brother-in-law was actually a professor there. Oh, really? I've been. I I lo I think Knoxville is a really nice town. I was there, and uh, it's a, it's a really peaceful place. I liked it. Yeah, I'm from uh, Chattanooga originally, and moved here to Nashville quite a few years ago. So I like Nashville a lot. It's a, it's a, it gets it gets crazy here because it's it's just it's just grown so fast. 
but it that, FedEx is in Nashville, right? No, that's uh, Memphis. Yeah, Memphis. Yeah. Oh, that's in Memphis. Yeah. Oh, okay. We it's got big a lot healthcare. Of stuff here, though. Healthcare industry is the dominant here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So in country music. In country music, who can forget that? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Forget <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, this is Sergio, by the way. Uh, how you doing? Co-host. Sometimes. Oh, nice. Nice to meet show. you. You too. Um. So yeah, I just want to get from to talk to you about this film, The Twenty One Faces of God. I mean, I, I watched this uh, yesterday, well, some on Sunday and some yesterday, recording this on the 15th, and I got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed by it. Um, I uh, got actually got a lot out of it and learned a lot that I just did not know about tarot, and we've talked a little bit about tarot on the show. We got, some, we got a friend of ours that actually practices it, does it. Um, mm -hmm. it's interesting whenever you're getting your tarot read because it, so many times that I, all the times that I've done it, I've always felt like it's speaking to me. I don't know whether it's like a psychological effect or whether there's actually something magical happening, but, uh, it does feel like it, it, it addresses some things that are actually happening in my life at the time. It's, it's a very strange feeling. Yeah. And I've done, you know, probably in the thousands of readings for people. And it's, it never ceases to amaze me. It's it just, it's just, how, you know, how can, it, because if you think of a 10 card spread with 78 cards, you're literally in millions of possible combinations. Mm -hmm. I believe it's in the millions. <clears throat> or, so I'm sure there's a mathematician out there who can figure it out exactly. But when you think of all the possible combinations, it's like you said, that eerie feeling of, what is going on with these cards? It's, it's very, very, very interesting. Very interesting. And I think people look at them as kind of more mystical in origin than they actually are. Yeah. Because like as as you talk about in the video um, that this is, um, I mean, they originally used in a game. It was usually it was originally a card game. That's right. How, they, how it occurred. I, I'm I'm curious of like kind of like this particular film putting this together, what kind of sparked your interest and made you want to, to make this film? Yeah. So I, I got involved in the tarot probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. And so I was kind of toying with it. And then for a novel, I wrote your love incomplete was actually the last novel I published that novel. I was looking for a narrative structure. So I said, why don't I just use the major arcana? Because there is a lot of, you know, people have talked about there's sort of a, a journey that the fool takes. <clears throat> so I got pretty deep. Each chapter was sort of focused on one of the major arcana. So I got pretty deep into it. And to understand the major arcana of the tarot, you have to understand, you have to really get into astrology. You can't escape it. Yeah. You've got to learn something about Kabbalah. Um, alchemy is crucial to it. So I got pretty deep into it. And there is one problem with the tarot, I think. There's no there's no fundamental text. I mean, Kabbalah has its texts, alchemy has texts, you know, astrology has texts, but w there's nowhere where you can go and say, okay, this is an original old established text for the tarot. It's kind of like whatever anyone wants it to be. So, I thought, okay, I can write a book and I've always loved film. And I guess if you watch the film, you can see there's certain, a lot of references to, to different types of films. So I've always been interested oh, yeah. in film. Oh, yeah. And, and art and these things. So I wanted to make a film that just established what did these cards probably originally mean, first off. And second, I wanted to show that there really is a path. And I wanted to kind of weave that path using the different traditions to try and establish sort of a benchmark because there's a lot of stuff on the tarot out there, but honestly, it's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that, that's not very impressive. Um, you know, it's not like astrology or alchemy or Kabbalah where you can find really high level stuff written about it. It's kind of, it's kind of the poor cousin of the esoteric arts. So I wanted to at least kind of create something with, 
a high aesthetic value and hopefully an intellectual and spiritual value. Well, yeah, and it, it's more accessible, it seems like. You know, you have it's such part of popular culture, too, whereas alchemy and, and uh, Kabbalah and some of those other aspects of uh, Western esoteric tradition are kind of more elite, I guess. Yeah, abs- absolutely. And, and, and that's a great point because that's how I got into all this stuff. You know, I got into astrology through the tarot. So it really is a great way also to kind of bring people to introduce them. Like you say, it's, you know, it's out there. If someone sees a tarot deck in your house, they don't think you're nuts, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. It's become a more of a more of a normal thing. I remember I had a friend that had it when I was you know, when I was in high school. So we're talking like over 20 years ago now. But, you know, I can remember thinking, oh, that's kind of weird at the time because I wasn't as exposed to it. But now, you you know, you know, I know so many people that are into it and, and you go to the you go to a books a million or something like that. And you see a whole section of, of just cards and it's become really yeah. kind of a normal thing now. Exactly. And it can be a little confusing because you have, for example, you, can, you have the classic sort of Marseille deck. Then you've got the Rider Waite Smith deck, which is probably the most popular one. But then you have the, the the Toth deck, and then you have the Osho deck. You know, I mean, when you look at the Osho deck, it's so. I mean, there's a lot of different decks out there. I mean, and then there's crazy decks, you know, like the UFO deck, or I don't know, <laughs> Gilligan's Island deck. You know, I mean, there's some just crazy. For the, I think you know. Gilligan would be the fool. Is the Osho deck is that a, a, <laughs> is that a reference to the to the Bagwan? Yeah, exactly. Okay. He, that deck, I, I don't know how popular it is in, in the United States, but in Europe, that deck is incredibly popular. So when you, it's, you'll see it everywhere. And a lot of people who are interested in sort of Osho and say, um, you know, Hinduism, that sort of thing, you know, that, it's, it's a very popular deck. Just as an aside, have you seen that documentary, Wild Wild Country? Absolutely fabulous. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> that was a brilliant seen. documentary. Yeah, uh, right. yeah I, I would say it's got to be, it's up there in the top three or four of best I've ever seen. Because it's, I was just like, I couldn't believe what was I know, going on. I know, I know. It was crazy. Yeah, I had no idea of, I knew that he was in the United States. I knew that he had to leave the United States, but that was pretty much all I knew. And yeah, that, yeah, it's incredible. And, you know, I was having a discussion with, with a, of a third of mine the other day. We were talking about the role of the guru. Did, did you see um, Holy Hell? I don't know if you saw that. It, I it think was I saw that, yeah. The guy who basically, he was, uh, I guess he had been a porn star. Yeah, I know and what you're he, talking he, about. Yeah, yeah. The guys that went to, he was having sex with all his male um, followers and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then there's that other one where the guy just made it up. He, he had an Indian heritage, but he wasn't interested in the stuff at all, and he just went and made believe he was. So there's three documentaries out there about the role of the guru. And, you know, to tie it back to the tarot, in the film we talk about these archetypes. Mm-hmm. And I think guys like Osho and this other guy, uh, the porn star, I think what they can do is embody – they can embody that role, the archetype of the guru. And what's fascinating is it works. Yeah. If they play the role correctly, people wake up. Well, I think really we're so, wake up. I think we're really yeah. starved for those kinds of uh, male archetypes, and so when yeah. someone like that comes along, you know, it's everyone just gravitates towards them, and it's just like clockwork. Yeah, yeah, that that could be it. That could be it. Why the uh, why the writer weight dick um, specifically that you focus on that? That's that's the one that you focus mm-hmm. on. Um, not primarily, but singularly in the in the documentary. Uh, why that? Why did you pick that one uh, to focus on? Yeah, first of all, I, I'm I'm pretty conservative in my, you know, as a tarot reader, I use just one spread, <clears throat> the Celtic cross, and I'm a little bit stupid. Also, I have a terrible memory. So when I'm trying to, when I, I really like the Marseille deck a lot, the Marseille deck, I think some of those, the classic Marseille decks are beautiful. I have a, I have one, but for me to memorize the, the pips, the minor arcana without the image is really difficult. So 
for a couple of the reasons why I really like her work, you know, Pamela Coleman Smith. I think, I think she did a fantastic job on the illustrations. Um, and, and obviously Arthur Edward Waite was involved. So I think they're, they're pretty true to the original ideas. They're a little bit too Kabbalistic for my taste, but, and, and also it's the most popular deck in the world. So for a lot of reasons, I, when I began reading, I started using this deck and I stuck with it. So I wanted to make the film about the deck. First of all, the deck I use and I felt most connected to. Sure. That makes sense. And I also, I, and I think for people, if you're going to start with the deck, I, I would recommend this deck because, um, there's so much written about it. Um, and I think it's relatively true, and it's easy to remember the minor arcana because they have images. Right. If you have to re- just see a number and, and just – it gets – for me, at least, it gets a little bit complicated. Well, I've got the uh, – I've actually got here with me the pictorial key to the tarot by, by weight. Oh, okay, great. So this is – this has kind of been the only uh, the only real text that I've read about about the cards. But it seems mm-hmm. to be pretty in-depth. Yeah, and, and and that's a good place to start. I mean, that's 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 a, a very good place to start. That text. So basically, in the film, you go through the major arcana. Um, right. What's the difference there between the major and the minor? And was there a reason that you just did you choose the major arcana because that's what most people know? Are there any kind of like hidden symbolisms in the minor as well that? I guess I might be getting a little too ahead, but <laughs> but I'm just curious no, no, about yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's a great question because for a lot of folks, I think that's a little confusing. So we have to go back a little bit to the history of the cards. Originally, the cards had what was it, um, thirteen? That would be four. There were fifty-two cards. Now this would be in the twelfth, twelfth, thirteenth century. That they came from Egypt. So it was just a game, a game with numbered cards and three court cards, each suit. So there were four suits, right? Ace, ace to ten plus three court cards, and it was just a gambling game. It comes into Italy probably in the 1300s, early 1300s, late, you know, late 13th century, early 14th century, and then what happens is something really interesting is. The game becomes popular in Italy, and then somebody adds on these 22 major arcana to the deck. So they have really nothing to do with that original deck that arrived. Hmm. It was like a a higher level to the game. So I guess I'm not really a big card player, but um, these cards would trump the lower cards. So they would be a higher level card in the game. And most of the mystery, I think, in the I would say a lot, a lot of the mystery is in the major arcana. Now, what one other thing? If you think of the four suits as the four classical elements, right? So you have, you'd have fire, air, earth, and water. The major arcana is the quintessence. It's sort of the spirit. And that's why I named the film The 21 Faces of God, because it's, 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 it's the highest level of the cards. It's like a, a higher plane. So I think that when you're looking for spiritual meaning, or even folks that use the cards, say, in magical rituals, liturgies, that kind of stuff, the most interesting cards are the Major Arcana. That's not to say that the other cards don't have meaning. Of course they do. But I think the most profound piece is the major arcana, which are 22 cards. So they were introduced later on into this game by somebody. Right. And, but they have more like kind of like a deeper layer of meaning um, to them. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting because, it, so imagine you have a, a just a regular deck of cards, of numbered cards with a couple court cards for each suit. I think it was a minister, a king, and something else. So what they did was they took 22 of the most important archetypes of that period, which we're talking, most people date it like 1420s, 1440s. So early Renaissance, late medieval Europe, Italy specifically, they took 
the 22 key archetypes and put them in order. Now, the original Major Arcana didn't have numbers, but people assume that there was a certain order to them. Yeah. So it's it, it kind of captures a moment. It's almost like a like a Polaroid of the most potent symbols and archetypes of that period. And is that kind of the the influence of alchemy on that? Because you you talk a lot about alchemy in the film. And so is there, what's the influence of alchemy on, on the uh, tarot cards? Right. So the, the alchemic texts, the old alchemic texts from the Hellenistic period reemerge in Europe it, through Spain, through the translation schools in Spain, in late medieval Spain. What was that Al- Alfonso and Savio in, um, in Salamanca in that area, in like the 12th? 13th century, that period, those texts begin to emerge right about the same time that the major arcana evolves. So I think, now I couldn't, you can't prove it. I certainly can't. But I'm hoping that, I'm really hoping that some young folks, maybe doing a PhD somewhere, will pick up on that topic. I think that there's a direct influence of those alchemic you know, those images, there's like a series of images with a text. I think there's definitely an influence of those images on the original Major Arcana. I try and make the point that there's a lot of similarities between place, time, image. Can I prove it? No, but I have a really strong intuition that it's there. And I'm hoping that somebody will will go more in depth in that and see if they can come up with something. Well, that seems like the time where they were really taking these older philosophical concepts and um, creating, you know, uh, creating artistic abstractions for them. So that's what you're saying basically happened probably around the same time when the artistic abstractions that were in alchemy were going on also. Right, right. Those, those images were being, those, those series of alchemic images were being created. No, like the Aurora and on all those right at the same time. Mm-hmm. In Italy, as when it was when this came out, you got to remember these texts were for them incredibly magical, especially the older alchemic texts, but also the Hermetic texts. Mm-hmm. Now, the Hermetic texts didn't arrive arrived, you know, significantly after the Major Arcana up here. Maybe another what was it, 100, 150 years? No, no, about a hundred years. But it was in that time where all this stuff was was emerging. Remember that the texts for the Kabbalah come from Spain in what, the 12th century, 12th, 13th century? That's the Zohar right. and yeah. all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, you know, from like Girona and Leon and all those places. So it's there's a lot cooking at that time. And remember, the Gothic cathedrals were how old? You know, like Notre Dame and, and, um, and those, those cathedrals were built in the 13th century. So this is all happening at the same time. Right. It's a rich period. It's interesting that it happens around the same time also as the Crusades and kind of that opening up of basically the East to the West right. yet again. Um, what is it? The, the same times going on, the Aristotle is being rediscovered and um, all this right. Greek thought and all this stuff that had basically been lost to the Western world. And Spain was, you know, he said that was the real, the channeler of it. Um, and also too, you know, the, the, the idea of the ideas of alchemy, you know, a lot of people think, well, that's this whole, this old idea of we're going to turn metal into gold, but that really wasn't what it it was about. It was more of a, it was more of a spiritual practice. Probably, probably, but I, I'm, I'm convinced there was also the, the, the metallurgic practice. Oh, sure. So, you know, these, these things get, these things get, they get mixed and, and combined and, but yeah, on, the, on its highest level, absolutely. You know, it's lead. You know, you think of lead as Saturn associated with the planet Saturn, and gold associated with the sun. So it's it's Saturn would be time. You're stuck in time, and obviously the sun is always considered the most transcendent of the planets, right? Gold. Jesus is associated with the sun. Apollo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You talk about in the film the kind of these 
double concepts of you have talk about duality in the tarot and you talk about the the archetypes in the in there as well we'll talk a little bit about that because that's going to kind of further on the discussion about what these different some of these different cards mean Mm -hmm. yeah so duality um how can we go how can we begin with duality (laughs) the dualism as a dualism in in the medieval era was absolutely crucial, especially in the film I talk about the Cathars. You know, we talked about the Crusades. There was also a crusade against the Cathars, the Albigensian Crusade, yep. Yep. that went in and wiped out the Cathars. So that that idea of dualism probably goes all the way back to Zoroastrianism, where instead of having one, like we would think of in the Abrahamic religions, as one all powerful God you had two forces, one of dark and one of light, good and evil. You can't escape that. And and again, if we go back to Pythagoras, the Pythagoreans, you see that the Pythagorean opposites of the sun and the moon, good and bad, straight and um, curved. So that idea of what what we see, how we perceive reality, we perceive it dualistically. Always. It's always a contrast. And that's that's one of the most fundamental, I think, philosophical concepts there are. I don't think there's anything... You, you, it's hard to get deeper than that. Mm-hmm. Even in physics, you have matter and energy, you know? It goes all the way down. So yeah, dualism can't escape it. And so I, that that was very important in, in in all esoteric thought. I think dualism is probably the most important concept in all esoteric thinking, in astrology, in alchemy, wherever you go, you're going to find, you're going to find a dualistic type thinking. And this kind of travels through Gnosticism and then with the remains of that and the Alexandrian world, right? whatever survives kind of is, is, uh, you know, hibernates or is cultivated in Spain then later and, this is kind of where all this is coming through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it comes, it actually, yeah, it comes kind of both ways through for the, from Bulgaria mm-hmm. to the Cathars through Spain. It's, and, and you know, well, there is one fundamental question here that why are so many Westerners now attracted to these esoteric systems? And I think, in a sense, because these systems are closer to our collective consciousness than, say, the Abrahamic religions are. Well, in a, you know, s- mm-hmm, well, well no, I mean, in a sense, they've always been around, too. Like, I mean, the, the, the esoteric, the idea that, they, that they've been hidden for so long, but it, it, to kind of lend a kind of a counterfactual argument, you know, like the Nag Hammadi scrolls and uh, what Serviel mm. just mentioned about Alexandria. I mean, think if Alexandria had maybe won the uh, the primacy that Rome later did. I mean, how different we would be. I mean, we would be openly dualist. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, it's an, it's really interesting to think about yeah. what if what if there had never been a Christianity, what would be the Bible? It would be, it would be Plato. Mm -hmm. Right. For sure. Mm -hmm. That would be our, Plato would be our Bible and our pantheon of gods would be this pantheon of gods, the gods from astrology, which remember, those are the same gods that you see in Nordic mythology in, you know, maybe to a lesser extent in Celtic mythology, but also in, in the Indian pantheon, the Iranian, remember, Iran means Aryan. Yeah. I mean, that's what the word means. Yeah. So all of these traditions have an origin. But the Abrahamic religions, it's its a little bit foreign. And I think as they sort of fade away, people are looking for something that maybe that resonates with them. And a lot of these esoteric traditions have very deep roots for European people, I mean. Yeah. Very deep and very old, much older and I think it's almost more in our DNA than some of the stuff that you might see, for example, in the Old Testament. Well, and there was there was a lot of the esoteric traditions in Judaism, but they were kind of uh, 
they were pretty much off limits to people who weren't a part of that to begin with. And we only caught glimpses later on uh, when it started getting out and influencing, when the Kabbalah started influencing uh, non-Jewish people. Right, but even even the symbolism of the Kabbalah, the language, there's it, it's it's. I mean, if you, I always thought of the Kabbalah as kind of a Jewish astrology, in that you, it's, it's very, it's a little, it's a little bit similar the path, especially if you look at sort of the Hellenistic idea or the Neoplatonic idea of the soul descending through the planetary spheres. Right. It's very, it's, it's. I mean, Kabbalah, I just think is, is sort of geo, Jewish Neoplatonism. Yeah. And you know why do I, that's why I, I it never really resonated with me because why would I have to go to the Kabbalah when I have you know I have my own tradition you know. So I, to me, it just seems it always seemed foreign that language, that uh, it, it just it never resonated with me, like astrology does. And, and you, the gods of astrology, that was that pantheon of gods is you know it it hits me more. Even when Christianity does come into its own and establishes its power, you know, the the, the, the Catholic Church, you know, it, it takes all those old um gods and like uh elemental spirits and things like that and just turns them into saints and keeps the old traditions alive. You know, we were we just ended up like a couple of weeks ago. We were in Pensacola, Florida. We ended up in like this Mardi Gras celebration, which was really a celebration of Twelfth Night. And there's nothing really overtly Christian about a Mardi Gras celebration. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's just it's just a kind of a, it's just kind of a it's it's a kind of a placeholder. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very paganistic, and you know, and some people will say you know we'll, we'll be critical of that, but it's just you know these are the things that. Um, Christian came in, stamped over it, but that stuff has always been there. And yeah, I, I can see that kind of like the, a mixture. I think people are also interested in the kind of the esoteric tradition, but you're seeing a very, um, a, a, and it resurges now of kind of like a neo paganism too. Yeah. Yeah. You, know? you see a lot of that. Yep. So it's interesting that that, that stuff is kind of coming, coming to the, to the fore. Um, Talk about uh, the archetypes um, and the kind of like the power of that. Um, we've talked a little bit about this on the show. I actually a lot about archetypes on the show <laughs> for, good, for good. other things. I think your listeners are probably familiar with what an archetype is. No, uh, I'd it's, say so. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and and this goes back really, really. It goes back in the Western tradition to Pythagoras, and from the Pythagoreans who who see number as the ultimate archetype, then, the, I mean, Plato was probably, you know, a Pythagorean. So then with Plato, it becomes the platonic forms, these sort of ideal forms. And remember, that goes all the way through Western philosophy. You know, when you look at Marx, you, you don't think of Marx as, as a Platonist, but actually he was. <laughs> you know, Hegel, Marx, all these guys were idealist philosophers, and idealist philosophers are really Platonists. They they feel like there is an ultimate form either to history, to number, etc. You know? So these archetypes are extremely important. It's they're the DNA. They're how we see the world, how we visualize it, how it how it impacts us, how it, how reality impacts us is through these through these archetypes. There, I, I would say that re archetypes are more real than matter. Now, that may sound like a strange statement, but do you guys follow like the work of Dean Radin? I'm, f I'm familiar with him. Yeah, I'm familiar with him. You know, th there's, I mean, I was just watching a video where Dean Radin was showing how they were doing the double slit experiment and how you, you had meditators changing you know, how the wave function appears. So that interaction between the mind and matter, the archetypes are, are somehow fit in there. So if, if you consider consciousness to be sort of fundamental, the archetypes are fundamental to, to con they would be sort of the, the base, what do they call them? The, the, the particles, the, primary fundamental particles of mm -hmm. consciousness. 
they they're, they're the Higgs boson of right of consciousness would be the archetypes. The way we've discussed them on this show has been primarily in looking at like the UFO phenomenon and alien abduction phenomenon and those oh, right. those type of incidences and the these old this this idea that uh, our kind of like our popular culture um whatever this intelligence is reflects that back to us so you know 500 years ago an alien experience an alien contact or alien abduction experience would have been a fairy would have been like a fairy experience to somebody living in you know 16th century ireland or something like that now Right. You know, it's reflected back to us in the from like our science fiction and and what we expect it to be. So yeah, like the archetype really does fit into all that. Like I think that that like it, it almost feeds in. It's like a feedback loop, really. And as I as that's kind of how I understand it. Yeah, that that's a that's a perfect explanation. I'm sure you guys are familiar with Patrick Harper, his book Demonic Reality. Yes. Yes. He was on. He, there's a great interview with him from um, uh, Where Did the Road Go? Mm -hmm. Soraya, right? Yep, our good buddy. Soraya's going to be the next book. guest on the show, actually. He's the, the next episode. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Soraya's a good That'll friend. Of, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah, I was on his show, and actually, I think before we went live, we were talking about that book, and I would highly recommend that book, uh, Demonic Reality by Patrick Harper, because it really, it just what you were talking about, it, it talks about, you know, in in Lords, the Virgin appears, or in Fatima. Is there yes. any difference between Fatima and a UFO in in uh, Area Fifty One and all that? Is it or is it the same phenomenon, just repackaged? Right, and a lot of people don't understand that. I mean, it's like it depends on who you ask. So if you have kind of like as a person that is an ultra Catholic, they're going to say that yeah, well, Fatima, you know, that's not a UFO. That's a, that was a vision from God. But someone that is a ufologist is going to say, no, that wasn't a vision from God. That was a UFO. That was a flying saucer. And somewhere in the middle is really where the, where, is really where the truth lies. But the phenomenon is the same. It's just all how we interpret it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. And it's really hard to get your head around a little bit. Yeah, it can um, be. It really can. I think the best, one of the best expositions of that idea, did you ever listen to McKenna's speech at a UFO, con hey, there's a UFO, there's a famous UFO or like a conference. And it's so funny. You see McKenna get up there with a the tie on. <laughs> and he talks about that famous UFO experience he had after he ate, I don't know how many pounds of mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and the heroic, the heroic dose. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when he was down in in La Chorrera, somewhere in Colombia or something, and his brother went completely berserk. So he's out there just fried out of his mind, and he sees this enormous UFO coming. So he's having his big UFO experience. Except on the corner of the UFO, it has what was that vacuum cleaner company? Hoover vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> It has this big Hoover vacuum thing on it. And you should have seen McKenna giving this speech. And these UFO guys are going, what the heck is this guy talking about? Military industrial complex. Well, well see, that's, that's the thing is that we've talked a lot about the high strangeness um, material too. And it's just it, it, like when you get to that material, it's just like, how can any of this be like a nuts and bolts thing? How can this be like physically happening? Because it's just so bizarre that it's uh, that it's a it's like it's it's happening in some altered state. It's happening in like a stream of consciousness that it just something is just like that it, whatever it's communicating isn't quite getting through. Like there was this one that we talked about where this guy encounters these naked aliens and he gets taken on a ship and he hears this loudspeaker that says like "I am Jimmy Hoffa" or something like that. Like, <laughs> like what does that even mean? You know, well, the so, best one, the best one though, is the guy where the UFO comes and starts making him pancakes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. You need to talk to our good friend Joshua Cutchin. He's he wrote a book where that figured prominently in that. I think I've mentioned Josh like almost every show now, Sir Fields. So. Yeah, he's he's a good oh, buddy. I'll, I'll, I'll check him out. And you know, 
Jack Simonton, Roye talks yeah. about that all the time. And he, and he talks about how the the UFO kind of the I guess like the I don't want to call him yeah I should be respectful but there's a certain type of you ufologist is just nuts and bolts like these are machines these are little green men from from wherever they come from right and he and he makes the point that when they write up these reports they write out the weirdness they take yep. it out that's true so they're editing out all the bizarreness and but on the other hand when because I, I think Jacques Vallier is probably one of the most interesting of all the people in the UFO world. Oh, yeah. But he also makes the case that some of these materials, and he's a pretty bright guy. I think he was a physicist. I think that he got his PhD in physics. Some of these materials that they've taken from, you know, I guess, I don't know, these fallen craft, that the, the metal stuff, the physics of the metal just doesn't work. And that it has to be, it comes from somewhere else. So the physical end is still there. That's yeah. the part that, because you can't, if you go too consciousnessy, but there is that physical part, you can't deny it. Right, and that's true. And but when you look at things um, in uh, like apports, um, I think there are some like, you know, the cath some of the stories of the Catholic saints were just, um, they'll something will manifest on their body. Um, you, right. you have that tradition as well. These things that predate the whole U, UFO culture, you know, that we have now. Um, if you look at like the, even like the stigmata, that type of yeah. thing, you know. So you, you there is definitely like this. That's what I'm saying. That I think that there's this and there's we there's an intelligence that is behind it, and it can manifest in the physical world. Um. But it's not physical in the the way that the like the the old older run of the mill ufologists saw it, and I think that they're kind of dying out somewhat because I think the the more bizarre stuff is being looked at and more taken seriously and looking into it as like as part of a consciousness study, as looking at mm -hmm. altered states, all those type of things that now that is being taken much more seriously. And so you, you, there's, there's definitely been a, been a sea change in the way people are looking at that subject. Because the, the, the one problem that the sort of the nuts and bolts ufologist has is from their point of view, there's nothing weird about this. These are just like folks like us, but they're from some, a different, I don't know, planet or they wherever. Particular or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they came but down to make us pancakes, and then it's... But the weirdness, it seems what all of this stuff is telling us is that there's something much more absurd about everything than we're willing to accept. And definitely right. our standard mainstream view of reality, of consciousness and everything, is mistaken, and that it's just weird and almost, almost absurd. There's just like an absurd quality to... Seems like that's what. The, if there's a message, that's the message I think that we need to pay attention to. I agree. I agree. So getting back to the archetypes, their influence on the cards. Um, mm -hmm. When I first started looking into the cards, it it was a lot of that. Those ideas were pretty easy for me because I was familiar with Carl Jung's. So we're talking about uh, ideas. So we're talking about the archetypes of 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 people. Right, the collective unconscious, no? Yeah. So how does that play into the, the cards and these these archetypes of these individuals in the cards and the roles that they play and what they represent? Yeah, great question. So if if you think about our our if our culture itself, what what is our culture is emerges out of our consciousness, it seems to emerge in similar ways with similar patterns and similar roles really all over the world. But you can boil it down to certain basic archetypes. Like, for example, if we take the cards, the magician. So he's called a magician, but really what is he? He's really a kind of a trickster, a trickster alchemist. And so that trickster archetype appears in 
I don't think there's a culture that in the world that doesn't have some sort of a trickster in it to kind of shake us up, right? Then on the other hand, you've got the sacred feminine. That appears everywhere. On one hand, it's sort of a fertility goddess, which would be more the empress. And on the other, it's kind of the 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 deep spiritual feminine, a little bit woo-woo, no earth mother-y, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's the high priestess. And so it, you see you see these these fundamental archetypes keep appearing a, a lot of them appear in the major arcana. And I try and make the case that the fool is not really major arcana, he's sort of liminal and that he he goes through these these archetypes and that there, there's actually sort of a um, a path showing going from one archetype to another it can it's not exactly you know it's not it's not a, a recipe but it is kind of a it, it kind of pushes you in a direction if you follow that path in a spiritual direction it's about kind of like an individuation absolutely in, in Jungian terms yeah. that exactly it that's exactly it and it's a threefold path and you talk a lot about that the the, the number three comes up several times like oh the, yeah the, the, yeah yeah so you know the the idea of the like the, the triangle so what is that that path that the fool goes on to like well how is it divided Right. So there's a concept that's very old of the tripart nature of the soul. And in Neoplatonic thinking, and I believe in Gnostic I believe in Gnostic thinking, but also you can find this in in Zoroastrianism and things. There's sort of three types of humans. The ancient Egyptians yeah. had a similar concept too, interestingly oh, enough. Yeah. Right, with uh Isis, Osiris and um and um Horus, right? And and then in India you've got Brahman and um, what are the three? Uh, it's escaping me now. But yeah, the the three. So that that whole concept of the three. But in the Western tradition, it really does. Even in Neoplatonism, they talk about the sort of the earthy men, mm-hmm. the psychic, the psychic man, right? And then finally the spiritual man, the pneumatic. So you've got the body the soul and the spirit. And a lot of people get confused and they say, well, what's the difference between the soul and the spirit? And why do we have to have three? It's actually, it's, it's it, from a Jungian point of view, it's crucial because if you think of things emerging into a duality of spirit and matter, the soul is like mercury. It sort of mediates between the two. It allows them to communicate. And it allows you to sort of move back and forth. So the th- the tripart nature of the soul, I think, is crucial. It's absolutely crucial. And the fact that I, w- I was given a conference in somewhere, and someone asked me, why did you call them the 21 faces of God? I said, first, I hate the number 22. It's just an ugly number. Four? I don't like it. <laughs> and also, you can't divide 22 by three. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was my first thought when you said 21. You know, 21, yeah. Seven and, and the third three. thing is, mm-hmm. the fool is zero, and zero is not a number. It, from for the Greeks, zero did not exist. The idea of zero, they they hadn't thought it wasn't part of their cosmology. So when we have give the fool zero, it's like saying he's kind of neither here nor there. He's not minor. He's not major. He's sort of that liminal figure. Um, so yeah, I try and show that the first seven cards are more about the physical plane and the body. The second seven, well, that, so we're talking about the magician to the chariot. And then the second seven level of cards, from strength to temperance, it's more of the psychic level, and then the last level. Now, to get to that last level, you got to pass through the devil. And then you get to the world, and that's the, that's the highest level, the spiritual level question that i was wondering when i was watching it um was you know uh i don't know how big of a fan you are of crowley stuff but i believe Mm -hmm. that he talks a lot about uh where you have to cross the abyss and you have to face your demons and then all of a sudden you get to some other level and when you say Mm -hmm. you 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 have to you know that that last level is guarded by the devil essentially 
Is that kind of a similar concept? Could he have gotten that from that idea? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it goes back. That's a pretty old idea. I'm not, I don't think Crowley's the guy. I don't think he invented it. He just kind of focused on it. No. Yeah. yeah. I'm not a big Crowleyite. I mean, I've read I read his I've read some stuff of his, and I read his autobiography, one of them, and it it just didn't resonate with me. Um, so I didn't. I don't. It's yeah. The film doesn't have a real Crowley kind of kind of feel to it. But yeah, for me, the devil is. It's it's the ultimate mirror. So you you can't lie to yourself and continue on a spiritual path. It's all going to come out, and you have to accept it. You have to accept the humanity and all. And humanity, there's nothing good ethically about humanity. I think people are mistaken about that. Especially, how old are you guys? I'm 42. 35. Oh. Okay, good. So you're not like super mega millennial kind of no. <laughs> social justice types. No. Yeah, because like you see that with a lot of young people today. They have a real problem with accepting their own humanity. They want everything to be good. And as humans, we are not good. No? We're killers, murderers, rapists, thieves. Yeah, I mean, we do some nice things, but we also – we ha- that's part of our physical animal nature. And that's battling with this higher spiritual level that we have. So until you accept that and just f- accept it for for what it is, you're lying to yourself. And that's what the devil is telling you. Accept all of it. And from a Jungian standpoint, you know, you want to try and integrate most of it. You know, Shadow, <laughs> yes. all of it. Yeah, maybe not all of it, but you know, as much as you can. <laughs> and that's what the devil is. It's. I think it's. It's actually in a in a simplest form. It's just maturing, knowing yourself, thoroughly and completely, and being honest with yourself. You mentioned it before, but the this whole concept of the fool's journey, um, mm-hmm. the the fool being the the card that's labeled zero, that uh, in this path just kind of represents you, you yourself or the, mm-hmm. the the neophyte that is going on this journey. Um, and you equate that in the film also with like the Grail legends and Parseval and and all that material, the Joseph uh, Campbell stuff too. The Joseph, yeah, the hero's journey. Um, what, Absolutely. You know what? To, what is the fool's journey? Basically, I mean, what is that? What does that basically mean? What is the fool seeking? He's seeking the Grail. And and in the sense, what's really important on a historic sense are those those early grail legends begin to emerge in like a, like the early 12th century yeah uh, you know in the period before before the cards and they were extremely popular so what is the i mean what is the grail what is the philosopher's stone i think it's it's really basically the same not i i don't mean like in a in a pure sort of literal sense but in a spiritual level, it's the same thing. So Parsifal is looking for the grail. The, the, the alchemist is looking for the philosopher's stone. But they're looking for the same thing. And what is the grail? What is the philosopher's stone? It's that, it's that beginning of the transcendent life where you stop being sort of a Labrador retriever who talks and you become something else, you know? And that that's what it is. All of a sudden, you wake up again. And, it, you know, that's why that phrase in, in Christianity is kind of sad. It was kind of sort of hijacked by certain groups. But, you know, that whole born again, remember when Jesus talks about being born again yeah. in the wind and all that? That, what he's talking about there, you know, you don't know where where it's coming from or where it's going, but you know it's there. That's he's talking about. That's that concept of the Grail of the Philosopher's Stone. It's all the same stuff. And in a sense, you do have to, you, you, your life changes when you become aware of that. You lose fear of death because you already died. Also, yeah, yeah. And 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 it just and it it just fades away. You don't really care. You almost look forward to it. You know. And they always talk in the mystery schools, in the Lucinian mysteries. 
when the people went through the second mystery, they come they they one of the things that was often talked about is they lost the fear of death. Mm. You you do reference a lot to Christ in the in the film. I noticed that you use a lot of uh sequences from Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, absolutely. And I think actually a lot of people have I've gotten a lot of pushback from that, from sort of the more woo woo y folks who think that anything Christian is just, oh, it's bad, it's terrible. No. It's not cool, it's patriarchal. And that's absurd. Because how how can you live in Western culture and reject all the probably most fundamental archetype of our culture? Right. True. And it and when I hear people say, Oh well, there's nothing Christian about the tarot, that's just that's insane. That's like saying there's nothing, you know, I don't know. You, you know what I mean? It's 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 the soup where it all came out of. So that whole concept of the cross, the duality of the cross, the idea of transcendence. I mean, anyone who knows anything about art, when you look at the world, that card is, the you know, it's Jesus with the four Gospels, you know, the eagle and the lion with the Vesca Pisces. That's a, a famous painting. But you couldn't put that on a deck of cards. You, you know, you'd get hung. So they, they changed it to a woman in that. But, I mean, that's clearly what the world is. Which card is that? The world, the last card. The world, okay, yeah, yeah. See that was I mean it's a symbol for Christ. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was that was really interesting that part. <laughs> yeah, the the world is the yeah, that's that, that's the ultimate that, that that's the end of the journey essentially, right? Yeah, and and I try and make the point and I think it's really important that it it it's not it's it's kind of it's the beginning of that transcendent wave. It's like you catch the wave, but it's not a singularity. It's not like I reach it and then I'm done. But you begin, once you get to the world, then it all just begins to open up exponentially. And it's like, wow, you know? It's like the beginning of the DMT trip. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's interesting that you took it there. Do you, do you uh, is there... I mean, do you think that there that there has been like the use of that in the past, like around this time period, like the you know, like stuff like DMT or or, the, or going back to the uh, the mystery schools, you know, and the the, yeah. the urgent speculation and stuff like that. Apparently, in the Eleusinian mysteries, they're definitely they were using something. Um. And there was a case of two young men who stole the recipe and were selling it or making in 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 Athens. Oh man! And, um, young drug dealers. And they in were, Athens. and they were executed. Ooh. Which in Athens, the Athen the, the Athenians weren't ex you know weren't like you know mega bloodthirsty, but yeah, they executed them for that. So it seems like there was. I'm not saying that, but I, I think you have, we have to be careful when we say, well, it, it, that's the sort of like the key to every, there's a lot of people want to think, well, that's the key, right? Sure, right. I, right. I'm not, right. I, I don't like to go that far, but if you've ever done DMT, you know that, well, you know, it, do, it does it does push things along a little bit. I have never <laughs> done it. I, that's not, not something that I have done. Well, you should try it. <laughs> Is that for personal experience? Yeah, I did uh, 5-MEO. DMT. Right. And it sent me to Palookaville. I mean, that was just unbelievable. It changes your life because it's, you, you reach a completely different dimension. And that's where you can get into all that UFO and stuff. But what's so fascinating about it is it's more real. It's the most real thing you'll ever experience. That's what it's I've a heard. hyper reality. That's what I've heard. It's like waking up from a dream I've heard. Yes, yes, like yes. The way this it's, contrasts to a dream, it's like even more real than this is now. It, that's exactly, at least in my experience, it was exactly that because I completely blacked out. And then I woke up and I thought I was done. I thought I had made it. I was like, ah, yes, I got through. And then you have to come back. And the coming back is brutal. For me, it was. I had a very bizarre experience, though. It lasted much longer than normal. It was almost 40 minutes, when it's usually about 10 or 15. Yeah, that's what I've heard, that it doesn't last very long. But your time, mm -hmm. your perception of time is so whack that I don't think it 
really matters, does well, it? Unless you take ayahuasca, then ayahuasca, well, that does last a little while. But it, yeah, and ayahuasca is 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 just gut wrenching. Yeah, a lot of that pooping is, and throwing up. Yeah, I I mean that that you pay the price, but with the DMT, it just sends you. It's just like it's like getting out. It, it's interesting. I was watching other people do it. Yeah. And you see, it, you you've it it takes a it takes a solid pair because some people just flip, and they start screaming. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Stop, please. It's like. It's like you hug one of those Apollo rockets, and it starts to take off, and then you're like, "Oh shit!" You know, no, you got, you just gotta, you know, you just gotta say, "All right." You know? I think that's the part that I'm just like. I guess to me, that's why I haven't done it. You know, a lot of people that are around me, and of course, I've talked about it quite a few times. I've had, I've had guests on that have done it. I mean, we had a guest on early on that did the whole ayahuasca experience. You know. But yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's like that initial thing. I guess I'm just, I don't know. I'm kind of afraid of that. But I guess that's part of the the ordeal, right? The ordeal is part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was scared. I was terrified before I did it, because I had done. It was one of those weekend retreats, so we did ayahuasca, and then the next day you wake up and just like, oh my god, and we did some like group therapy you know, thing where all these people are crying and all this stuff. And then I asked the lady, I says, well, should I do it? And she goes, don't ask me. I mean, you know, if you want to. <laughs> and so I was like, I said, ah, fuck it. And I did, and I did it. And it was definitely worth it for me. Worth it. Wow. I mean, I, I got to the other side. I thought I had made it. When I woke up, I was like, this is it. I'm done. I don't have to, I'm, I made it. And I had that experience. It's, that's an amazing experience. It's like you die for me. I'm not saying this happens to everybody. but And I use the 5-MeO, which is generally more of a spiritual trip than just a straight DMT. But I woke up, and I was there. And you know what? It was, it was actually really interesting. When I woke, when I came out of it, you see what's there, but it's it's completely different. And I – can we cuss on this show? Or? Oh, I'm fine. Not better. It. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, just I, I said, I said you have to be bleeping kidding me, and I just started laughing. But I've never laughed like that because it was like I understood absolutely everything. Huh. But it the was cosmic so joke. Exactly, but not in a bad. It's not like you tricked me. It was, it was, it was a fun. It was a laugh. I use that in the film where I talk about you know that laughter, but that came from that trip. Yeah, it's just like you can't. You've got to be kidding. This is it, and it, but it's it's a wonderful feeling, but it is all a little bit absurd. I think there's an that's why when you talk about the pancakes, there is something yeah. a little bit absurd about this thing. We take it a little bit, I think. Too, I think it's, we take it a little bit too seriously. Too seriously, and that's that. I guess that's that trickster element that's you know poking at us to not take it too seriously. Exactly, exactly. That's the role of the trickster. Hmm. Exactly. I want to talk a little bit about the first, let's talk about the first five, well, was it five or six cards? So we've kind of talked sure. about the, we've talked about the full. We touched on the magician too. Yeah, we touched a little bit on the magician. Um, that's the, actually the technically the first card because that's what right. said, the full is zero. And, and he just opens up that bag and takes out those four elements. The next four cards are those four elements. Air, um, fire, earth, and water. Now, you said you're interested in the Jungian? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've been Jungian in the Jung stuff. for a long time. Huh? Yeah, so it's the Jungian functions. You just think of air as thinking and water as feeling. Yeah. Uh, the Empress is sensate and, um, and fire's intuition. So that's the next four cards. So it, they're broken up, and you see each one of those fundamental. Imagine the fundamental particles of consciousness. There they are, those four. Then they get put back together in the lovers, and on the chariot, off you go, buddy. You, but you've got through that first. It, we're talking about the fundamental sort of particles of who we are. The second level of car. Did I go too quick there? I'm sorry. No, that Maybe was good. We'll, we'll swing back to the. I, I we'll did want to touch on real of, quick. What are the corresponding suits to to uh, what elements do the different suits correspond to? Oh yeah, that's that's really important. Yeah, so swords um, is air, 
what cuts, what dries, that's air. Um, wands is fire. And then obviously cups is water and pentacles is earth. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So just think about breaking up those, those fundamental qualities there. And then they come together in the lovers and the lovers it's, it's, it's merging them together. And then in the chariot, it's like you're, you're pushed off. It's like take off. And there you enter into that second psychological level. And this is when we get into the, 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 um, uh, oh, it's, it's skipping my mind. The, the, uh, the four, uh, classical virtues. So you get strength, which is fortitude at the end. The last one of that second level is temperance, right? Then you have justice in the middle. The one that's missing a little bit is um, wisdom. But I like to associate a little bit the high priestess with wisdom. I mean, I'm pushing there. I'm kind of making it fit. Right. But um, so on that second level, the second level is it's fascinating because, you know, once you've kind of dominated the material plane, you have to kind of separate yourself from that physical identity. That's strength. That's fortitude. And I use the bullfighting metaphor there. And then I use, you know, controlling the passions. Jesus with uh, Barabbas. Mm -hmm. Barabbas yeah. wants to go out and kick some ass. And Jesus is like, you know, you're, you know, you're kind of losing your mind here. Um, and, and then it goes on to the hermit. You have to introspection. The world is a fascinating card because that's when you got to separate yourself from destiny. And destiny in, is so crucial in all these esoteric, especially in astrology, but also in, you know, in a lot of this stuff. Are we doomed to our destiny or is, it, is there something else? You talk about the will and of in, fortune? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and in that card, I mean, that, that's, that's almost like a Buddhist. There's a lot of Buddhism in that card. Of Maya transcending that idea. And remember, our traditions, you know, if you go back far enough, you know, Buddhism is part of the Western, that, that original culture that we all emerge out of. So I'm not afraid to, to include a little bit of that there. The Indus Valley and, ideas. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah. Yeah, that, that whole Indo European culture that, that goes off into Iran. Northern India with the Vedas and then and then into Greece and then off into the northern parts to so the Latins and the Greeks and whatnot. But anyway, once you get to justice, justice, I think, is a really probably the most justice in the chariot are probably the two most platonic cards leading the just life, controlling the passions with um, with with strength, with fortitude, controlling the appetites with temperance. And controlling reason with wisdom. If you do that, then you lead the just life. You're controlling the chariot. That chariot metaphor is so important. And it's very platonic. Now, once all that happens, you get to the hangman. And the hangman is when you begin to wake up. The hangman's a fascinating card. Which, what, just by the way, which card do you guys most resonate with? I'm not, I'm not sure. I can't really tell you a particular one. Um, I like the magician probably. Yeah. The hierophant kind of, uh, strikes me as always kind of strong. And what are your, what are your, what are your signs of the Zodiac? I'm a Leo. Scorpio. Ah, uh, okay. The Scorpio, Scorpio, you like, you're the Jungian guy, right? Yeah. 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 That makes sense. You Scorpions. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely like into to the bottom. I think. Yeah, and I definitely <laughs> like the trickster elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the the whole idea of the hangman as seeing the world upside down. Remember, in in Renaissance Italy, also these were shame paintings, shame graffiti. People were were drawn up, hanged upside down. So if you were a traitor, um, is something like that. Is there a meaning mm -hmm. to his in the weight deck? His the way his leg is. Uh, yeah, the cross. Bent, yeah, yeah, the way his leg is crossed. Yeah. You know, I, I, I don't have a real strong opinion on that. I mean, I've looked into it to try and see what that means. Is that is it trying to replicate the cross? Yeah, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Or is there like an, 
maybe you could trace out a number or symbol. I don't know. It says here in this book, the pictorial mm-hmm. key that Serfiel has, that the gallows from which he is suspended forms a tau cross, while the figure from the position of the legs forms a fill-fought cross. I've never heard that term. Yeah. I, I have to say, I tried, while making the film, I tried to stay away from from books on the tarot itself. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I wanted to give it, I wanted to give it a kind of an authentic. Yeah. You know, because I've been studying stuff a long time, so I was like, all right, let's not rely too much. I was looking for stuff to kind of support what I, you know what I mean? So I, I kind of avoided that. And for bit. people to have more of a visceral reaction, too. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, I hope when people watch this, they feel the cards. Right. And, f- and feel what the, because archetypes, you can't, you can't, you, you can't study an archetype. I mean, you can study an archetype, and studying an archetype will help you. But that breakthrough moment, that insight moment, you, it, it just it just hits you. It's like an epiphany. And, you know, you can't, and I think it's much easier to have that insight with music with art, with film, than with some guy just rambling on about, you know, what the card means. We're such a visual culture now, too. Yeah, oh which my God, we I, are. Which is why I think some of the... It was interesting watching your film, because some of the sections you narrate and some of the sections you chose not to, and I was wondering why you 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 did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the first one I didn't narrate was Hierophant. So I, I kind of wrote out, I wrote out my text for the Hierophant, and I started putting together the images and the music. So in the Hierophant, for me, I focus a lot on the logic and the reason that's embedded in music that emerges, emerges in math. So you see, you know, I, I put in math and that. So I, I put it together. And when I put it together, I felt like, you know what? I, there's nothing nothing I say is going to add to this. And a lot of people are going to get annoyed. But the people, uh, at some point, people are going to, if they can watch it a couple times, the Hierophant, I think if you just watch it and listen to that music and the images, you'll get it. Yeah. I, I, re- I really think that the voiceover by kind of explaining it would have confused people. What was the um the purpose of the uh showing like the the clip from the Soviet Union where they're singing the international Right. Right, right. Well because you know how I begin with that scene in Whiplash. So he's yeah. the conductor of the symphony, you know, and he, he creates an order. And uh, I, I love that okay. and I end this and then you go to the Pope, and then the ultimate order, the ultimate dogmatic order. Because remember, it can be music, but it also can be political dogma. And to watch all those people stand up to that picture of Lenin on the 100th, the 100th birthday of, um, what was it, the revolution, the 100th anniversary of the revolution, and they all begin to sing. So it connects back to whiplash. And, you know, when you get what I'm saying there, it should become clear that, you know, because like I say, this it's not these... Hierophant isn't good. He's not bad. You know, it's what it is, right? Remember, a lot of people watched that Soviet thing at the end and they got all emotional. They remember the good old days. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think you it said laugh, like, ni- I'll tell you. yeah, I think it said like 1918, 1978. Yeah. And I thought this, exactly. this is interesting yeah. footage. I mean, it's interesting footage, first of all. And so the Hierophant. I guess that because you talk about, so the magician high priest is the empress, the emperor. Those are the four. They also, they, they represent earth, fire, air, water. And you get to the hierophant and he's the hierophant is air. He's air. He's air. He's reason. He's reason. He's reason. Okay. He's logic, order, dogma, philosophy, law. There's, I put a picture of Jefferson in there. Yes. And then I put that, that famous equation what's it called uh, Mueller's identity and it, you see the numbers rolling and rolling and rolling and then plop so i mean that's that whole magic of math of music of philosophy dogma but it can also be very tyrannical so it's it's got those different fe- it's got a feel to it 
You gotta feel, and if if you become a reader, you gotta feel the cards. You can't think, you can't do reading and, and start thinking about it. And, and is is and is he also to maybe this level that most people are going to uh, attain to, and then they're going to stop there and not go on to the other levels. Absolutely, because the remember when I talk about the opposite cards. You know what the opposite card of the of the um, <clears throat> the opposite card of the tower. I'm, I'm sorry, of the tower is the hierophant, and the opposite card of the lovers is the devil. So when you, if you want to understand, really understand yeah. the hierophant, look at the tower, because that's all that dogma, all that Soviet stuff, all that stuff with the flags and the constitution, and it all just goes kaboom. Goodbye. Doesn't work anymore. Is that why you showed Building Seven? <laughs> yeah, you could say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, hey, this is conspiracy normal. Yeah. We, can, we can talk about that. <laughs> no, that, that's something I've I've heard a couple people reference, and it's something that I almost connected almost uh, instinctually. You know, the the towering inferno with with the uh, with nine eleven. It's kind of bizarre. I mean, let's face it. It's a little bit. It's a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. Especially, but, since, but on. Uh -huh. okay. Especially okay. since you got people falling out of it, in the card. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. You know, let's 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 go back because let's go back to what you're talking about the pancakes and the weirdness. Okay. The weirdness around nine eleven, is just. It's mind-boggling the weirdness, but on all sides. You know, I mean, you you wherever you go, you just find weirdness and more weirdness, and it's almost like the weirdness never ends. And so when you and all of a sudden you think nine eleven, and the tower card, you know, and then the Fight Club, which came out in what what year? The Fight Club came out ninety nine ninety nine ninety nine. Uh, you you Matrix, know what? It's interesting that you put that. I'm sorry to interrupt your thought, but it's interesting that you put that in the movie, because when 9/11 happened, I immediately thought of Fight Club. I immediately thought of that end scene, and then you Are juxtaposed you? that with the actual with Building Seven coming down. I was like, Building whoa. Seven. And that that was intentional because yeah. of all the weirdness of 9/11, and I don't mean I don't mean to be disrespectful to the people, you know, to you know the death and the destruction sure but the weirdness of building seven is just you know with, where do you have that woman at the bbc saying oh you know it just collapsed and you see it behind her you know you you, you, you guys all know that video now yep. yes everyone's seen yep. that so i mean when you see all that stuff with building seven and then you know how it fell and then it did we pull it and you know, I was talking to actually just this is a bit of a tangent, but I was talking to actually another guy who has a, has a podcast today. We were just BSing. And, you know, Building 7, how many PhD theses are there by structural engineers on how Building 7 collapsed? I think zero. No, I don't. I don't know. And, and I'm not. But I'm just I'm just throwing it out there. Because if 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 the official story is true, which it might be, what what the hell do I know, right? You would think that there's tons of theses. Well, wow, we have a building here. Look how it collapsed. I mean, if you were going to do a PhD thesis, that would be probably a pretty interesting one. I wonder how many there are written about it. You know what? I don't think there's too many. Yeah. I don't think there's too it many. It might get you kind of blackballed, so it may not be a good idea. Yeah. But just all that weirdness. And even in The Matrix, that whole scene with the passport, yeah. you know? Well, then also All that. on that day, mm -hmm. a, a, a pentacle was broken. So I thought that was kind of strange, well, too. Well, the, the Pentagon, I mean, it can be oh, seen right, as a pentacle right. that was actually broken. And, you know, the yeah. seal was broken. So that's pretty weird, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well but what is the symbolism of the, the, the tower? What, what yeah, does it the mean? the tower is... Yeah, the tower is clearly, it's the darkest moment in in the spiritual process. It's the dark night of the soul. Okay. There is, it's, and it's, if you look at the fool, the fool after the hangman, he dies. That's death. 
Death he dies. Not physically, but it's it's the old self. And then he begins, it's all through the night. So you get the death card. Then you get temperance, which is... Now, the temperance card there is interesting because I like to refer to this... There's many ways to look at it from an artistic point of view, um, from temperance over the appetites. But there's also the temperance of the waking up process of people. You know when people just kind of at all – they call. I remember when I st- first started getting into all this stuff, I was a bit nuts. I would start talking to people, and they look at me like, what is wrong with you? You know, like you kind of get too excited. You feel like you know everything. You get You become like David Icke or something, you know? You start listening to David Icke videos. You're like, oh, man. <laughs> David Icke is God. He knows everything. You know, you make kind of a jackass out of yourself. And that's okay. It's okay. In the, the Jungian explanation there is inflation. It's, it's the inflation period. And that cycle of inflation is important because you inflate, but that inflation is you're touching something so powerful it, it, it almost makes you psychotic. And you have to remember, that's how Jung came to all his theories, by studying these psychotic patients. Yes. And seeing that there was something transcendent. It was like a transcendent moment that went wrong, that their their egos were not stable enough to, 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 to survive the interaction with this transcendent force, and it turned them into psychotics. Yes, I've, I've personally witnessed that. I mean, I have a, uh, you know, a... I have a friend I grew up with who had a a lot of problems, who was into this kind of stuff, and it uh, did not interact well with him, to say the least, whereas I know plenty of people who have been able to go down all these rabbit holes or, you know, on their own spirit quests and have been okay. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... It it, it shakes you around. And, And you know what? I wouldn't recommend people who've had you know, tendencies towards psychotic breaks and things to get too involved in, in the occult. It's better, yeah. it's better not to, because these archetypes are very powerful and they're going to shake you up. And, you know, I do seminars sometimes where I teach people the tarot and you see people get very, just by spending a weekend studying it, you know, not, we're not doing like, you know, shaman dancing, you know, Osho things. We're, you know, we're studying the cards and I'm explaining to people how to do a reading. It shakes them up. So you got to be careful with this stuff. It's not it's not for everybody. Yeah, that's Definitely. that's one of the things we were talking about earlier where we were talking about how people are getting interested in this stuff and like the occult is one of those that is becoming really more and more popular now. And uh you know, we talked to uh Mark Stavish, I don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with him, but um he we kind of talked about this with him how you know, a lot of people are getting into it and a lot of them are not really mentally prepared to be getting into something that is so serious. Uh, yeah, I think it, because, for example, I was brought up in a very religious, I have a very religious background. You know, I had to go to church every Sunday and be an altar boy and priest and all this stuff. But it prepares you a little bit because you're used to liturgy you're used to ceremony, these symbols that kind of get ingrained in you. But there's a lot of people who have no background at all, and they just dive into this. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think you have to be – it's better to go a little bit slower and, and maybe, maybe enter a more traditional path. I don't know, Buddhism, something like that, some kind of yoga. You know, start out a little bit slow, and then you can go – because you, you need to build a base. Yes. It's not, it's easy to get lost. Very easy. Yeah, that's true. This, um, this whole journey for you, I mean, what have you gotten out of it most? Like, are you, are you, are you just kind of enjoying spreading this kind of like this knowledge and like your ideas? Like, has it been in like a kind of a personal enlightenment for you as well? Oh, yeah, but it goes way back, I would say, for me, you know, it began, I mean, when you look back, you see how it's something that was always kind of bubbling and bubbling, no? And slowly, slowly kind of evolved. I was was very, I was very interested in Eastern thought, but then eventually you kind of, kind of, you got to have to, you kind of have to come home, you know? And so I came back to the Western tradition, and for me, it's, it's been a fabulous experience, because, 
you know, in the end, the, if, the, the spiritual life is the life that really gives everything a sense of reality, of meaning. That the other sort, because I mean, I used to work in in advertising. I was I lived in New York in Manhattan. I made pretty good money, but you know, the, in the end, that life, it's you always have that feeling like something's missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you live this life, and you you don't have that sense of all, at all. I mean, it 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 all means something. It's there's, you know, it's it's a it's a world full of wonder, an enchanted world, and um, it's. You know, it's 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 a path, and, but it is a path. It's not like you, you never. I never have that feeling like, oh, I got it. But I always, I do have often have the feeling like, oh, I'm getting it. And as long as you have that feeling like, ah, yeah, it's starting to get clearer. There's no need to to feel like I need to see it perfectly. As long as it just gradually gets a little bit clearer and clearer, it's you know, I've got no complaints. Well, yeah, that's. I uh, I'm pretty impressed. I, I uh, by the video by yourself. I, I think this has been an interesting interview. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Um, where can people find uh, the film and also see? I mean, I've seen that you've got a, a couple other films up there as well, uh, or other videos that people can can find you. And you also have you've kind of got it in two formats. A, a little, it's, you got the long form version, then you've got it all split up. Right. So exactly. So I, I make there's a long form version and then it's split up into the 27 parts. So there's five introductory parts and then one section for each one of the cards. So and you can find all I've done quite a few podcasts and things. You can find all that on the YouTube channel. The easiest way is just go to YouTube and just put in the 21 faces of God and you'll see me, Robert Bonomo. You'll see my site with the film. It has um, other interviews I've done, and now I I've I also do tarot readings. Cool. Um, and that's actually something that for me, it that also kind of connects me. I get a lot out of that. So because when you do a reading with somebody, um, you know you 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 get that wonder like how how could this be? How could there be this synchronicity between this question, this dilemma, and this spread? So I do I do readings and it's not that expensive it's fifty dollars. You get I take a look at your natal chart just quickly. You no, know, like a ten minute. I just like to get a feel for the person. We go through their natal chart really quickly. I do a Celtic cross spread, and then when we finish, um, if you want it recorded, I can record it, and then I send you a PDF. It just gives you the spread of the cards and a quick explanation of the reading. Cool and. And that site, that site is tarotjourneys.org. And I'll leave a link. You guys will, if you guys can leave a link there, people can get in contact with that. And just one other thing, I've written yeah. a couple novels and a bunch of articles. That's all on my website, thecactusland.com. There's a lot of stuff on there: politics, finance, zombies, cats. <laughs> cool. you name it i've written about it <laughs> cats are really the ones that have achieved true enlightenment in the world that's that's what my wife says you know, they're the true <laughs> bodice shot fills, i think <laughs> <laughs> well thank you robert so much i mean this has been awesome um we're gonna close out we're gonna be back to close out the show but robert please stay on the line for us and we'll be right Absolutely. back on conspiracy normal Yeah, so here we are. That was a very interesting show. Yes, it was. Got into I uh, did you you watch most of the video? Yes, most of the film. Yes. What were you, some of your thoughts on it? Uh, it was it was very interesting how he I'd never really taken all those different aspects of the tarot. We didn't get into a lot of the how he relates it to other sacred geometrical systems and astrology and like some yeah. mathematics and all that kind of stuff. So it was really interesting, but we really just mostly focused on the symbology of the tarot yeah, um, and history of it as well. 
Yeah, and I'll save that for people so they can go watch the film. I mean, it's like two hours and 46 minutes long. Yeah, it's a lot of info. And so if you don't, if you, he also has it, like we talked about with him in kind of, uh, what was it like? There's, he's got an, each, each section, he's gotten chunks. So that's a little more digestible for somebody. Right. But it, but it is interesting. And, uh, you know, we also talked about how some of some of the stuff of the ter- the uh, cards has ner- have narration and some of them don't. Mm-hmm. Which when that first one, the uh, the Hierophant, uh was the first one you didn't do narration. I was like something wrong. So I went back to watch the Hierophant in the smaller section, and uh, then I was like, okay, I see, it. you know, I can see what he's doing. Mm-hmm. So, so you know, it's and there's a lot of uh, stuff from popular films. Some of the which I I didn't even recognize. Like, you know, good, there's a scene from Goodfellas in there. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple of other scenes from like older films. So, um, very, very highly recommended 21 Faces of God. I was pretty impressed by that interview. Yeah, it was pretty wild. So, anything interesting on your mind there, sir? No, not much. We did uh, go on a little adventure today. Yes, we did. We went to find Ben Allen's grave. Yeah. And, uh, who is the... Uh, we got fairy led in the Mount Olivet Cemetery. Yeah. He's the famous Nashville occultist who uh, I've been doing all this research on. And finally uh, went to find his grave at Mount Olivet Cemetery, which is where most of the uh, well-to-do people in Nashville were buried. Um, he died in 1910. And we had a pretty hard time finding it. I guess, what did it take us about a... It was about an hour. Hour, yeah. We were walking And had we looked to the right instead of to the left. Yeah, yeah. But uh, he was probably taking us on the path, like the like the fool's journey. Yeah, that was our, yeah I uh, think we were on a fool's journey. That was on our fool's journey. I mean, about all of it, man. It's I mean, it's a cool place. Yeah. Um, it's we, an old cemetery here in Nashville. Huge obelisks, monument, mausoleums, yeah. tombs, pyramids. I mean, yeah. There's was... the one big one that's a pyramid that uh has these two sphinx is in front of it mm-hmm. there's and a lot like of sphinx you can see it, you can actually see it from the road you can actually see it from Lebanon Pike if you pass by it you can see that pyramid yeah like you know he John, just wanted something simple oh yeah nothing yeah. too too just flashy. a simple man you know just a simple man what did it say i think i took a picture of it i'm gonna look for it right here uh it said some interesting it had things a, on the stone had a poem on it yeah, it was, this tablet is placed here in loving memory of our honored father, Major Eugene C. Lewis, a man whom posterity will, posterity will know and honor by his good works. He gave freely of his talents that his fellow man might enjoy more abundantly God's great gifts of nature. He was a laborer in the building of a life which led to the attainment of the highest ideals, truth, honor, and purity. And then the poem, now the laborer's task is o'er. Now the battle day is past. Now upon the farther shore lands the voyager at last. Father, in thy gracious keeping, leave we now thy servant sleeping. That was on the pyramid with the uh, two sphinx in the front. Yep. You know, that was a different mentality back then, man. Oh, yeah. For sure. Uh, And the reason we went out there was you've been doing some research on Ben Allen. If yeah. anyone heard our Patreon episode where we actually, I read the actual uh, funeral procession, and you said you found another funeral, Masonic funeral in the area that was also described. Yeah, there was another guy who uh, named James D. Richardson, who is a prominent politician and the minority leader of the House at one time, and I think he was a successor to Albert Pike in control of freemasonry who actually lived here the scottish right freemasonry and he had one as well i believe in what's his death date i don't know it's a bit later he had it like down 19 in, 1914 was what yeah he, he died, died afterwards yeah. so he had a knight's kadosh funeral as well uh which seems even stranger than alan's but uh that was that's pretty interesting i've been learning a lot about that um and trying to get enough material to make some kind of work, whether it's just a monograph or I'd like to like to 
make more extensive work, but we'll see. What's the Knights Kadash? What's that? What's that mean? Uh, the Kadash, I believe, is the Holy of Holies in the temple. Ah, so they're just a branch of free of like normal Freemasonry or Scottish Rite. Uh, I believe that's a that's a degree in Scottish Rite. Yeah. Okay. But the Kadash, the word and what it represents is a, the Holy of Holies, I believe. Interesting. Interesting stuff. But we found Ben Allen's grave, and it has a replica of... He was a metallurgist as well, I guess, and it has a uh, a replica of his sword on top. So it's it a pretty interesting grave. Yeah. These are some fascinating people. They they definitely like helped to build their own kind of like small Masonic Republic. Like, uh, you've been studying a lot of that, you know. We won't go on too much on that. We're gonna <laughs> eventually we'll talk about it. Um, we may do some Patreon things, kind of along those lines. But uh, so anyway, I want to thank Robert Bonomo for coming on the show. Um, next week uh, I do have Soraya, as we said before, he's coming back, and uh, I don't really know what we're gonna talk about. I just think I'm just gonna want to jam with Soraya about some of his weird experiences and get some updates on stuff. Like we haven't had him on, yeah, by himself in a while, so he'll be uh, good to jam with. Yeah, he def he always is. Soraya is a uh, we could we could talk about some interesting stuff. I want to get Soraya on conspiracy theories. We don't talk yes. about, he doesn't talk about enough. Yes, like that let's, do that. let's do that. Let's do that. And uh, we don't have Rob. We didn't have Rob today. Robless. Uh, this is one of our Robless weeks. A robless he's, night. He's he's got his uh he's got his gig that he's preparing for to rock out the eighties. So uh guys, we have a lot of stuff on Patreon. Uh Sergio, you tell people where they can find that. Yeah, uh you can go to patreon.com slash conspiranormal. Uh we have just put up a little uh little documentary video we made of our trip in weird in weird florida that you can only see by being a patreon we might release it to the public later on but uh took our little first stab at some video i uh, hope you guys like it and if you do not want to subscribe and just give a one-time donation you can go to conspiranormal.com and do that as well we really appreciate any kind of help you guys can give us and we're trying to deliver as much of this bonus content as we can well, that's the plan. All right, guys. We're going to close it out here, but uh, join us next time. We'll have Soraya on Conspiranormal. Normal.